Hi, welcome back to the Story by Podcast. Thanks for stopping by. Today's episode is maybe suited more for Halloween, but frankly, I felt like doing it, and it's fairly short, which tend to be my primary concerns when selecting stories, especially when I have a time crunch. Ace is also back. She plays the female lead, Typhoid Mary, because I needed a bored, irritated, teenage female voice, and that seemed a role custom-made for one's own teenage daughter. Thanks, Ace. I can talk more about the origins of the story after the show, if you want to stick around. For now, why don't we join Mary and Dusty on their first, and possibly last, ghost hunt. Ghost Busted Under a rising full moon, a battered van decorated with rust, road dirt, and the spray-painted logo for the Grant City Ghostbusters, with a Z, rolled down the darkened pavement. In the shotgun seat, aiming a hand spotlight out the passenger window, sat Mary Worth, who, because of her preference for black fabrics, black lipstick, and studded bracelets and belts, was often called Black Mary, or Crazy Mary, or simply That Witch. She really wanted to be called something cool, like Typhoid Mary, but she couldn't get it to stick. Her sometimes boyfriend, Dusty Barnes, drove the van, wore cargo shorts, band tees for groups he'd never heard, and was totally sure he was due for stardom as soon as they could graduate and get out of their hick burg. He thought Mary was the coolest girl in school, was probably about 50% in forever love with her, but cautiously keeping his options open in case he got famous. They were on their first big haunted house case, and they were both stoked. Dusty was confident he was going to get real, undeniable proof of evidence of ghosts, and Mary was confident they wouldn't find squat, and hoped Dusty would stop playing Ghost Hunter and get an actual job. Periodically, the van passed gated entrances to the estates along the roadway, and Mary swept her light across the address plates, searching for the proper location. What was the address again? She asked as the number 551 flashed past. 667 Mockingbird Lane, Dusty replied. It'd help if they had streetlights out here, Mary grumbled. I guess robber barons liked it ominous and spooky. Whatever. I still can't see. There it is! Mary shouted. Dusty mashed the brakes and the van screeched past a huge iron gate. He dropped it into reverse, shot backwards past the entrance, then pulled into the driveway as far as the spiked metal gate would allow. They waited a moment, then Dusty beeped, shaving a haircut on the van's horn. They waited some more. Mark said he'd meet us here, Mary said. But I don't see him. Dusty honked again. After another lengthy wait, Mary growled, I guess I'll get out and open the gate. Cool, thanks, babe. Mary heaved open the passenger door with a wail of rusty hinge. Her heavy-soled boot sounded like a pair of hammer blows as she dropped onto the pavement. She looked around for an intercom box, or cameras, or some way of getting someone's attention. Then she gave up, walked toward the closed gate, and pushed. The two massive halves of the gate swung open silently. Mary stepped out of the way as Dusty drove through the gate, then she hopped back into the van. I'm leaving the gate open for Mark, she said. And when you run screaming from the house, you won't have to stop to open it, Dusty replied with a smirk. I won't run screaming anywhere, because there's no ghosts. We'll see... Dusty said. We'll see. Did you just repeat yourself for dramatic effect? What? No. I, uh... Reddening, Dusty dropped the van into gear and drove up the long, winding cobblestone drive. After what seemed an eternity, they reached the circular turnaround in front of a sprawling stone mansion. Dusty stopped the van next to a massive fountain with a statue of an angel fighting a devil. Dusty leaned across Mary to look out her window toward the hulking building. He let out a low whistle, then said, I didn't realize it was that big. Said no woman ever, replied Mary. Very funny, Dusty snapped, sitting up in his seat. Thanks, Mary said with a smile. Ready? Mary shrugged. Dusty pulled a camcorder out, aimed it at his face, and said, Tonight, the Grant City Ghostbusters, with a Z, will be investigating the baronial mansion of Anton Garou. He paused, looked at Mary, and said, This is where you'll put the subtitle thingy that says Dusty, Team Leader. Yeah, I read your script. Ignoring her derision, Dusty said, Then I'll cut to you. He aimed the camera at Mary, added, And you'll be Mary, team researcher, or something. Then you'll tell us the boring facts about the place. 
With a sigh, Mary shuffled through her brother Mark's chicken scratch notes and said, The baronial mansion of timber magnate Anton Guru, built in the late 1800s, boasted ten bedrooms, two ballrooms, an indoor pool, and a library containing more than a hundred thousand hardcover volumes, pamphlets, and other priceless written pieces. Bathrooms, said Dusty. And thirteen bathrooms, Mary replied. Dusty swung the camera back to himself and said, One for each woman he strangled, in his best dramatic voice. Then he followed with, Cut! He shot off the camera, turned to Mary, and said, Let's haul in the gear. A short time later, Dusty stood in the ornately decorated foyer of the mansion, sweeping his camcorder around and marveling at all the medieval antiques. Meanwhile, Mary dragged in the last of their equipment cases and parked them next to the other gear she had dragged in. That's the last of it, she replied, theatrically wiping her brow. Thanks, babe, Dusty replied. He set down his camcorder, opened a small case, and pulled out an electromagnetic field meter. He fiddled with it for a minute, then began to wave it around the room. I'll check for EMF while you set up. Cool? Sure, Mary said, and aimed a pair of raised middle fingers at Dusty's back. Dusty wandered around the room, sweeping the EMF meter back and forth, while Mary unpacked laptops, more cameras, lights, and other electronic gear she didn't even recognize. Where did you get all this stuff? She said, searching for an outlet to plug a power strip into. Borrowed it from Professor Watsitz up at the college. Hogan Moore? The guy that looks like Egon that the news guys interview every Halloween? Yeah, him, Dusty replied, wandering in wider circles in the room. Still no major EMF. Weird. Mary found a lone outlet, plugged a power strip in, and began plugging gear into the power strip. Then she turned everything on. There was a huge EMF jump! Something's here! Mary rolled her eyes, then replied, Yeah, about $10,000 worth of electronics, doofus. All of which emit electromagnetic energy. Dusty scowled at her, then said, Well, I felt something cold pass by when it happened. Maybe I should check the infrared thermometer. He grabbed another gadget from a case and began to wave it around the room. The temp keeps changing. The entity must be in motion. Or you are, Mary replied. They measure surface temps, Dusty. There has to be a physical surface to shoot the thing at. Look, smarty pants, all the other TV ghost hunters use these things. Mary sighed, said, And they're using them wrong. I keep telling you, these gadgets can't detect anything they aren't designed to detect, like ghosts. Dusty, pouty and annoyed, tossed aside the thermometer and grabbed a digital camera. After a moment to get the lens cap off and figure out the buttons, he began to aim around the foyer and snap flash pictures. He paused after a while and began to flip through images on the camera's view screen. Holy bleep! Mary looked up from the laptop she was working on. Now you're trying to sound like a TV ghost hunter? G-g-g-ghost! Dusty blurted out, followed by, And an orb! He aimed the view screen at her. Mary grabbed the camera, looked at the image. She glanced behind Dusty, then said, The ghost is your reflection in that weird mirror. Mary pointed at the warped rumor reflection in a large, ornate mirror on a stand behind Dusty. The orb is the flash reflection. She pointed the camera at the mirror, snapped a flash photo, then showed the display to Dusty. See? There's the back of the ghost you, and the orb is a flash deeper back in the field because I'm standing farther away. Just because your picture is my reflection doesn't mean the one I took isn't a go- <laughs> Something crashed to the floor in a distant room. Bleep! Dusty exclaimed. Oh, for the love of- I'm gonna go look. Mary set the camera down and headed off through an arched doorway into a room off the foyer. Dusty picked up the camera and followed Mary's path through the viewfinder. A few moments later, Mary shrieked- <laughs> and flew back into the foyer. It's him! It's Anton Guru! She blazed past Dusty, hurtled out the front door and down the steps. As Dusty watched, a well-dressed, wide-eyed, pale figure with long hair and a goatee appeared in the doorway from the other room. The man held a wire stretched between his hands. Bleep! Dusty screamed and flew out the front door. A moment later, Dusty's van rocketed down the driveway toward the gated entrance. I told you there was a ghost! Dusty shouted over the sound of the van's engine being taxed to the limit. The theme from John Carpenter's Halloween erupted from Mary's pocket. She dug around, pulled out her phone, glanced at it, then answered. Mark, where are you? Mary screamed at her phone. She followed with, You're in the house? Dusty's eyes widened and he said, Oh, bleep! Mark! Mary screamed. Get out! There's a killer ghost there! At his reply, she added, Because we were just there! A pause, then she said, Mr. Jones didn't see us? Who's Mr. Jones? The caretaker. And you're standing with him right now? Mary deflated. 
The van barreled toward the gate, and Mary said, Take a right. But home's the other way, Dusty yelled. We're not going home. Slow down before you kill us. Dusty let up on the gas, bounced the van out the gate onto the street, and veered to the right. A few moments later, Mary pointed out her brother, who wore a t-shirt with an Atari logo, and shuffled feet encased in all-stars. Mark stood in another driveway, below the stone arch of another gated entrance. Beside him, a man in his mid-fifties who wore work coveralls, stood with his arms crossed and tapped his foot. Dusty pulled up beside them and Mary lowered her window. I said 677 Mockingbird Lane, said Mark. Right, Dusty said. That big creepy pile around the corner. The pale man stood amidst the abandoned equipment cases in the middle of the foyer with a phone to his ear. Well, it's not exactly an emergency, he said to the 911 dispatcher. My name is Nigel Slander. Yes, that's my favorite album too, love. Thanks for... I'm at 661 Mockingbird Lane, and I had an intruder. Uh, or maybe two. No, they aren't still here. I was restringing my guitar in the back conservatory, and I heard something out in the foyer. Yes, it startled me, and I dropped my guitar. Then this vampire girl walked into the room and screamed at me. Ghost Busted was originally a five-page script that I wrote for the monthly screenwriting competition on the, sadly, now defunct website, moviepoet.com. Each month, they would generate a writing prompt. People wrote and submitted scripts, all of which had to be under five pages. The scripts were rated and reviewed by the other members, and a trio of winners were eventually selected, and those results were published on various screenwriting websites. It was a fun community to engage with, and a great place to start when you'd hit that blank page block and needed a prompt to get you going. At least one of the screenplays I wrote for Movie Poet was produced as a short film. There are a few others I'd like to shoot myself, when I get some time. The core story was probably inspired by something James Randi mentioned on one of our local radio stations when he was in town to do a presentation. It involved a ghost hunt that he participated in that included a psychic who experienced all sorts of negative experiences, evil energy, and contact with the historical victims immediately upon arrival at the home. After a lengthy, very detailed performance, the psychic was informed that they were all at the wrong house. At the time I wrote the original screenplay, several ghost investigator shows had sprung up. So many, in fact, that several elements common to each had already become such standard tropes, they had nearly become parody. Like most skeptics I know, I'd be fascinated by the discovery of life after death, or the spirits of once-living people somehow being capable of existing and interacting with living people in a meaningful way. But so far, I haven't seen any evidence of it, and realistically... If any evidence is discovered, it's unlikely to be by amateur investigators running around in the dark, scaring each other for ratings. Now that I've honked off the friends and or family who adore ghost hunting shows, I'll wrap up this episode. Thanks again for stopping by. I really appreciate it. And I hope to see you next week for another episode of the Story By Podcast. Story by Podcast is a production of Fiddling Around Productions, LLC, and copyright 2018. Theme music is provided by Nalani Proctor, nalaniproctor.com, and used with permission. All other music provided by Kevin McLeod, incompetech.com, edited by Lewayne L. White, and licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0 license. <laughs>